Hello and welcome to FYI Weekly, your official source for the latest news and information from the city of Greensboro. Progress is being made as tornado recovery continues to assist impacted residents in East Greensboro. The Federal Emergency Management Agency, or FEMA, and the North Carolina Emergency Management Office are detailing the summary of recovery assistance provided by FEMA as of May 29th. 160 registrations for individual assistance have been approved. The amount approved for housing assistance is $278,000. Approval for other assistance needs is nearly $215,000. The Small Business Administration has approved loans in the amount of $90,000. Nearly 570 housing inspections have been issued, with more than 520 of those inspections completed. The number of registrations in Guilford County is nearly 1,100, with another 84 registrations in Rockingham County. FEMA has opened two disaster recovery centers to help those whose home or business was damaged by the tornado in April. Representatives from North Carolina Emergency Management, FEMA, and the Small Business Administration are on site to help survivors apply for disaster assistance. The center in Guilford County is located at the Guilford County Department of Public Health, located at 1203 Maple Street in Greensboro. The center in Rockingham County is located at 1716 Freeway Drive off of Business 29 in Reedsville. The operating hours are Monday through Saturday from 9 a.m. to 4.30 p.m. They are closed on Sunday. Those seeking disaster assistance are encouraged to register with FEMA before going to a recovery center. Applicants may apply online using a secure website. To be considered for all forms of disaster assistance, applicants should register online at disasterassistance.gov or download FEMA's mobile app. The site will list the information applicants are required to provide. Residents without internet or cell service should call FEMA's helpline at 1-800-621-3362. The City of Greensboro is accepting applications for its premier public education program, City Academy. The application window is open now through June 30th. This program is celebrating its 15th year and is designed to develop civic leadership and build a stronger city through well-informed and engaged residents. The program is free for participants. City Academy takes residents behind the scenes of city government operations through interactive presentations at various city locations. Students visit the police firing range, Guilford Metro 911, and the Greensboro Transportation Operations Maintenance Facility, just to name a few. Classes are held weekly from 5.45 p.m. to 9 p.m. from September through November, with graduation scheduled for November 20th during the City Council meeting. City Academy is open to as many as 30 residents representing all five City Council districts and various backgrounds. To apply for the Fall 2018 session, visit the City's website or call the Community Relations Office at 336-373-2723. In an effort to help each of us improve our quality of life, the city has partnered with Cone Health for a series of brief and informative videos designed to inspire you to make better choices when it comes to healthy living. Let's check in with our friends at Cone Health for today's news for your health. Hi, I'm Kate Clark. I'm a nurse practitioner at Labour Healthcare at Stony Creek, a member of Cone Health Medical Group. Whether you're having fun in the sun or playing hard in the yard, I have a few safety tips to keep you and your family safe this summer. Let's chat! When it comes to pool safety, there's a few tips I'd like to share with you and your family. Whether you're at the pool, lake, or beach, it's extremely important that you apply sunscreen. I recommend an SPF of 30 to 50. Once you apply, you'll need to apply it and keep it on your skin for at least 15 to 30 minutes prior to exposure to the water or the sun. Once you've applied, you need to ensure that you reapply every two hours. We lose a lot of the lotion through our sweat and through the pool when we're in the water. Also, did you know that when you're at the pool, lake, or beach, the light can reflect off the water and cause even more exposure to your skin? Other tips for pool safety. Please ensure that once you're at the pool and you're not in the water, to wear sunglasses for eye protection and also a hat to protect your ears, face, and let's be honest, it just helps you to read a little bit better. When it comes to pool safety, it's extremely important to remember a few tips. It's important to always walk around the pool area. You may not see it, but it could be slippery. 
Also, make sure that you're not diving into any areas that are not designated for diving. If a lifeguard is not present, please take precautions and ensure that there is a trained adult at the poolside to be available for any assistance that may be needed. Let's talk briefly about heat stroke and heat exhaustion. What is heat stroke? Basically, heat stroke is when your body gets to be too hot. When your body gets too hot, the organs in our bodies try to compensate by becoming faster. Signs and symptoms of heat stroke. Fast heart rate, fast breathing, lots of sweating, sometimes confusion. Who's prone to heat stroke? Our elderly population is more prone to heat stroke, especially when working outdoors. People with chronic illnesses like heart disease or neuro diseases are more prone to heat exhaustion. But anybody can get heat exhaustion or heat stroke if you're outside for a prolonged amount of time without proper hydration. If you suspect that someone has heat exhaustion or heat stroke, it's important that you cool them down immediately. Bring them into the shade, spray their body down with water, and fan them. You'll need to take them to the local emergency department as soon as possible. Their body may require IV fluids and rehydration. Did you know that the average male requires about three liters of water a day? The average female requires about 2.2. This is before being outdoors or exercising. When you're outdoors for a prolonged amount of time or exercising, it's important that you drink at least about half to another full liter of water. Whether you're working in the garden or hard in the yard, there's a few tips that you should remember. The southeastern part of the United States is endemic for Rocky Mountain spotted fever and Lyme disease. These are caused by ticks. If you notice a tick on your body, then it's important that you take note of it before you pull it off. If it's large, odds are it's been attached to your body for several hours. If it's small, then likely not. Do not feel like you need to bring the tick into the office. However, take good notes about it. When you want to remove the tick, it's important that you take tweezers and slowly pull from the head of the tick off away from your body. Take note of any signs and symptoms, which may be Lyme's disease or Rocky Mountain spotted fever. Poison ivy and poison oak, two plants that can cause a lot of pain and discomfort that are around our area. Have you ever heard the term, leaves of three, let them be? That's pretty good advice. These plants are green and they have three leaves per stem. If you come in contact with these plants, it's important that you wash your skin immediately, take off your clothes and wash them as well. Now. If you develop a rash, which may likely happen, it's going to be uncomfortable. You'll have a lot of itching. It's very important that you do not scratch and that you apply moist, cold compresses to help prevent itching. You can also use calamine lotion, which can be purchased over the counter. If your rash does not clear up in the next couple of weeks after you notice it, please seek attention from a medical provider. The rash will only spread if you come in contact with the oils of the plant through either a pet or, or your clothes which is why it's extremely important to wash your body and your clothes immediately. Thanks for joining me. I hope these tips have been helpful to keep you and your family safe this summer. For more information on summer safety or wellness topics, please visit conehealth.com wellness. I'm Kate Clark. Thanks again. This is the time of year when thunderstorms are prevalent, which can lead to flash floods. Find out how to safeguard your home. We'll have that story and more news coming up after the break. Stay with us. Welcome back to FYI Weekly. In recent weeks, we've experienced recurring thunderstorms, which can result in flash flooding, offering little advanced warning. There are things you can do now to protect yourself and your property. Elevate electrical panels, air conditioners, heat pumps, furnaces, fuel tanks, and water heaters at least 12 inches above projected flood heights. Report blockages in storm drains, culverts, and under bridges by calling the city's contact center at 336-373-2489. Consider purchasing flood insurance. Flood damage is not usually covered by a standard homeowner policy. Never dump anything down a storm drain. Storm drains carry untreated water directly to our streams and lakes. This polluted water adversely impacts aquatic wildlife. Find out if your property is located in a flood zone by calling the city's Water Resources Department at 336-373-2055 or visit the state's flood map website. 
Greensboro Transit Authority, or GTA, is setting its sights on what transportation will look like in 2040. As a result, GTA's Mobility Greensboro 2040 plan recognizes the vital need for an updated public transportation system. The Mobility Greensboro 2040 plan will establish long-term strategies and programs designed to make the Greensboro area's bus system more efficient and increase the number of bus riders. To achieve this, GTA is conducting an in-depth study that assesses the changing transit needs of the Piedmont Triad's residents, employees, students, and visitors. The study will unfold over the next 18 months. Residents can help to shape the future of Greensboro by taking a moment to complete an online survey. The study will shed light on untapped markets and service areas where service can be redirected, determine what network structure works best, and what new services and technology can be utilized. For more information about Mobility Greensboro 2040 or to take the survey, please visit getonboard2040.org. The Greensboro Public Library will host New York Times bestselling author Lynn Hinton at 12 p.m. on Tuesday, June 12th at the Glenn McNary Branch Library. Hinton is the author of 20 books, including bestsellers Friendship Cake and Pie Town. Hinton is a native of North Carolina. She attended Wake Forest University and is a graduate of UNC Greensboro. She also graduated with her Master's of Divinity from Pacific School of Religion in Berkeley, California. Hinton is an ordained minister in the United Church of Christ and has served as a hospice chaplain and as a senior pastor. As a pastor and hospice chaplain, Lynn brings a sensitivity and emotional heft to her characters, and she delivers an incredibly heartfelt and original story. The late Dr. Maya Angelou said, I would welcome a friendship with Lynn Hinton. I would welcome an invitation to sit down at her table, but mostly I would welcome her next book. This event is free and open to the public. McNary Branch Library is located at 4860 Lake Jeanette Road. To learn more about the exciting programs and resources at the Greensboro Public Library, visit the library's website. In an effort to spotlight and celebrate local artists, business owners, community builders, and essentially the next generation of leaders, the city is proud to partner with Action Greensboro to introduce our Made in Greensboro series. This day, we place the spotlight on Greensboro Science Center employee, Shannon Fletcher. As a keeper at the Greensboro Science Center since 2014, Shannon Fletcher spends every day with some of the center's most charismatic and popular animals. She's responsible for cleaning, feeding, and making food for the center's Asian small clawed otters and African penguins. The Greensboro Science Center is just one of a handful of zoos in the world that have been carefully chosen to be a part of the species survival plan for these African penguins. They breed the endangered marine birds, playing matchmaker to bird couples chosen by the Association of Zoos and Aquariums to maintain a healthy and genetically diverse population. Raven is Shannon's favorite. Raven greets Shannon every morning, and during the penguin feed, she likes to sit on Shannon's lap. She describes Raven as being her soulmate. To learn more about Made in Greensboro or to see more images taken by photographers Jerry Walford and Scott Mothersbaugh, visit the Action Greensboro website at madeingso.com. The Small Business Administration has been on the ground in the aftermath of the tornado that hit East Greensboro. Coming up after the break, find out how to apply for the recovery dollars available through the SBA. Stay with us. Welcome back to FYI Weekly. It has been nearly two months since hundreds of properties and businesses on the east side of town were in the direct path of a tornado. 
Joining me now to tell us about recovery dollars available to assist with the much needed repairs is Lori Dana. She is the Public Affairs Specialist with the Small Business Administration. Hello Lori, welcome Hi. to the show. Thank you for having me. Absolutely. We're so glad that you're here on the ground to assist our residents and business owners who were directly impacted by the tornado. Tell us what is the SBA disaster loan and is it geared towards business owners only? When there's a disaster, the SBA provides assistance to businesses of all sizes, not just small businesses, but they also provide disaster assistance to homeowners and renters, as well as churches and nonprofits. Okay, so that's good to know because if people go by the name of your organization, they may only think it's for businesses. So what is available as part of the SBA Low Interest Loan Program? Okay, the SBA offers low interest, long-term disaster loans to homeowners for their primary residence, to renters and homeowners to make repairs or replace personal property, such as the, the contents of their homes or their cars. And um, businesses can borrow up to $2 million to repair or replace their assets. That includes inventory, their buildings, equipment. Businesses can also apply for working capital loans uh, to help them pay the bills they would have been able to pay if the tornadoes hadn't hit. Nonprofits can apply for disaster loans to make repairs or replace assets for their nonprofit. That includes churches. Oh, wonderful. So you're, you're covering a broad spectrum of all entities within the community. Yes. Um, the, another thing is that landlords, they can apply for their rental properties as a business. Okay. So you've told us who should apply. How do you apply for an SBA loan? The first thing that residents should do is register with FEMA. And if they're referred to the SBA, they can apply online at www.sba.gov slash disaster. That's, again, that's www.sba.gov slash disaster. They can go to a disaster recovery center. There's one right now at 1203 Maple Street. Um, I don't know how long that's going to be open. It depends on who's going there. And, I mean, it depends on people going there. Um, then they can also call 1-800-659-2955 and have an application mailed to them. Okay, so all options if you're not online, as some people aren't, it's good to know there's still snail mail. Yes. And uh, who should um, people call or what should they do if they get a denial letter once they have applied for your loan? Okay, and that, uh, if you haven't, um, if you were referred by the SBA to complete a disaster loan application, we really encourage you to do so. Um, if you don't, um, all assistance stops for other needs such as um, moving expenses and other FEMA grants that you, that you might be eligible for. So we really encourage you, if you were referred by FEMA, to complete a disaster loan application. If you don't, you will probably receive a denial letter. It'll have a zero amount and read whenever you get a denial letter from FEMA. Read the letter closely. It doesn't mean that you aren't going to get a grant. It just means that they may be waiting for other information. And that could be that you haven't completed the disaster loan application. It could be that, that you left out some other information on your application. It might be that you switched by accident a number, you know, like your social security number. So it's very important to read why you were denied. You can go to the, uh, the disaster recovery center, bring your letter, and they can help it explain what you need to do. Uh, the, the Disaster Recovery Center is a great place to go to have one-on-one -on -one assistance filling out your disaster loan application. Homeowners, they can borrow up to $200,000 to make repairs for their primary residence. And homeowners and renters, they can borrow up to $40,000 to repair or replace their personal belongings. And businesses, as I said earlier, can um, apply for up to $2 million. Okay, so if you see denial, don't let that stop you. Don't leave money on the table because you right. didn't ask questions. And, and you know, it, it, don't disqualify yourself either. A lot of people think, I'm not going to qualify for a disaster loan. Why bother? Well, staying, getting, being eligible for the other assistance that might be available is a good reason why bother. And the other thing is you never know unless you apply. Um, the, the SBA doesn't look at your credit score as much as your ability to pay. Have you been making you know, payments and, and do you have the income 
to um, debt ratio. Okay, that's good Good to know, good point. And deadlines are always important. Yes. Uh, we're coming into the second month since this tornado struck. How long do people have to apply for these loans? The deadline to apply for property damage is July 9th. Um, that's that's come about a month away, so don't wait. You know, get to the Disaster Recovery Center, call, go online. So anyway, July 9th is the deadline for property damage. Businesses that have economic injury, they have until January 9th, no, January 8th, 2019 to apply, and that's because businesses don't always realize how badly they were affected by a storm until later, so they have a little bit of time for economic injury. But for property damage for businesses as well as residents is July 9th. Okay, well, Lori, thank you so much for all that you're doing through the SBA to assist our residents as they are working to get life back to normal. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you for having me. Stay tuned for a little known fact about Greensboro as we tell you something about the city. That's coming up after the break. Stay with us. Welcome back. One way to stay informed about what's happening in the city is by attending or tuning in to city council meetings. The Greensboro City Council meetings are open to the public, but if you can't attend, we broadcast the meetings live right here on GTN, and we stream the meetings live on the city's website. Council meetings take place at 5.30 p.m. on the first and third Tuesdays of the month on Level 2 of the Melvin Municipal Office Building, located at 300 West Washington Street. The first meeting of the month includes public comments and special presentations. Meetings on the third Tuesday of the month focus on public hearings and city business. The fourth Tuesday is reserved for a meeting as needed. To review the council meeting schedule and agendas, please visit the city's website. Here's an opportunity to learn a little something about the city. Malvin Gray Johnson may be one of the most important Greensboro-born artists you've never heard of. Johnson fought in World War I and went on to become a significant figure in the Harlem Renaissance movement before his tragic death in 1934 at age 38. Johnson left Greensboro at age 16 to study painting in New York, eventually entering the renowned National Academy of Design. He was drafted during World War I and fought in the segregated 92nd Infantry Division in France. Today, his paintings are in the collections of New York Public Library's Schomburg Center, Fisk University Galleries in Nashville, and the Amstad Research Center, New Orleans. Discussing Johnson's life and art is Kenneth Rogers, director of the North Carolina Central University Museum of Art in Durham. Rogers curated a retrospective of Johnson's work at NCCU in 2002, resulting in an award-winning publication, Climbing Up the Mountain, The Modern Art of Malvin Gray Johnson. Johnson's artistic career and legacy will be the focus of the 2018 John B. Dorch Memorial Lecture at 7 p.m. on Wednesday, June 6th at the Greensboro History Museum, located at 130 Summit Avenue. Coming up after the break, we'll showcase our department spotlight, but first, prepare to mark your calendar for all the great events happening this week on the town. School's out for summer. Don't worry, we have lots of fun family activities for you and the kids happening on the town. On Friday, share what you love about the arts in Greensboro. Your feedback will help shape a city arts plan called Creative Greensboro that will work to keep our arts groups thriving. Be part of the process and head over to Hemp Hill Branch Library between 3.30 and 5 p.m. to share your opinions on Greensboro's arts and culture. You can also attend a free coffee and discussion event at HQ Greensboro between 4 and 5 p.m. to share your thoughts about the arts and culture in Greensboro. Check out greensboro-nc.gov slash gcamp for a full list of community engagement events and to fill out the survey. If you've been to a wedding reception, most likely you've heard the song September by Earth, Wind & Fire. Now you can see Earth, Wind & Fire perform live at the White Oak Amphitheater this Friday at 8 p.m. Earth, Wind & Fire has become one of the world's top-selling musical groups of all time since its formation in 1969 in Chicago and has sold over 100 million albums worldwide. For more information or to purchase tickets, visit GreensboroColiseum.com. 
Hang up your gone fishing sign. Lake Higgins is hosting a free children's fishing tournament from 9.30 to 11 a.m. on Saturday as part of the National Fishing and Boating Week celebration. Kids ages 6 to 12 can catch catfish in the Taylor Turner Hatchery Pond located next to the marina. Parks and Recreation staff will provide bait and fishing poles. Goodie bags, prizes, and trophies will be awarded. To register your child, call Lake Higgins at 336-373-3739 and go fish! After the fishing contest, head over to Tanger Family Bicentennial Gardens from 11 a.m. to 2 p.m. for a picnic in the garden. Parks and Recreation is celebrating summer with a series of family-friendly picnics in the garden. Bring a lawn chair, a blanket, and your appetite because there will be different food vendors to try at each event. Be sure to explore the beauty of the Botanical Garden and take a free tour of the David Caldwell Historical Museum after lunch. Check out the city's website at greensboro-nc.gov for more information. On Sunday, end your weekend on a high note with the musical stylings of the Greensboro Big Band playing swing and jazz music at Greensboro College from 6 to 8 p.m. as part of the Music for a Sunday Evening in the Park or MUSEF Concert Series. The concert is free and will be on the front lawn facing West Market Street. Visit greensboro-nc.gov slash MUSEF for a complete MUSEF schedule. Keep watching FYI Weekly right here on GTN to find out more about events happening on the town. Welcome back. The City of Greensboro has 22 departments and several divisions committed to serving you, our residents and visitors. Let's go behind the scenes in our department spotlight. This week we place the spotlight on the Minority and Women's Business Enterprise or MWBE program. This office promotes inclusive bidding for businesses owned by minorities and women using its economic power of purchasing to extend contract opportunities to all interested companies. Encouraging minority and women-owned companies to bid on city contracts increases competition, stimulates the local economy, and helps to ensure diligent use of public funds. Through the MWBE program, the city provides minorities and women an equal opportunity to participate in all aspects of city contracting and purchasing programs and prohibits discrimination against a person or business in pursuit of these opportunities on the basis of race, color, sex, religion, or national origin. On the other side of the break is this week's Way to Go GSO shout out. Stay with us. As we draw to a close, we always want to end on a positive note with our Way to Go GSO shout out. This week's shout out goes to the Greensboro Aquatic Center. The Greensboro Aquatic Center and local Subway restaurants hosted the fourth annual Swim Day in an effort to raise awareness and teach kids with autism basic swimming skills. Aquatic Center coaches and Greensboro Community YMCA National Swimmers taught kids with autism basic swimming skills. Special education volunteers provided perspective on water safety for children who are vulnerable members of our population. After the swimming lessons, participants were treated to a free Subway meal. That concludes this edition of FYI Weekly, but you can easily stay connected to the latest city news by linking to us on Facebook, Twitter, YouTube, and Instagram. For all of us here at the City of Greensboro, thanks for watching and we'll see you next time.